Well, good afternoon, folks. My name is Kevin Darty, and I'm here with Illinois Agriculture in the Classroom. And we are excited today to talk about soil. So as people are coming in, we do have a poll for you. If you take a minute and look at the poll questions and see if you know the false. Uh, one tablespoon of healthy soil has more organisms in it than there are people on the earth. True or false? Second, Illinois has a state soil. What is it? Is it Ipava, Drummer, Hickory, or Cisney? And finally, what was happening when Franklin Roosevelt said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself? Was that the Spanish flu pandemic, World War II, the Dust Bowl, or the Great Depression? So take a minute to talk about those as we get people coming on. Teachers, uh, throughout the process of this, if you have a question or your students have a question, uh, please let us know using the Q&A section. Uh, please identify yourself, what grades you teach, and where you're located in the state, and we'll share that with our guest. So we'll get started here in just another minute or two. Marion, we've got some folks already chiming in with where they're from. Mrs. Roan's fourth grade class from Beardstown is with us. They've chimed in already. It looks like the uh, poll is going well. Yeah. Getting good, getting good responses. It looks yeah, like you several, have people, several people must have uh, done a little homework ahead of time. That's right. Um, folks, you have to use the Q&A section, but we do have Mrs. Stansfield's class from Tuscola and Miss Murray's class from Taylorville. So Central Illinois is joining us along with Mr. Chilton's fourth grade Beardstown class. Tuscola's in the loop too with Mrs. Berger's class. And we've got a fourth grade class. Um, Miss Aline from Chicago is joining us. Welcome to all of you. We also have uh, Mrs. Kelly's fifth graders from Hamilton, Mrs. Martin's from third graders from Freeport. We're kind of missing the deep south today. Maybe they'll join us here in a minute. But with that, it's uh, 103 and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, folks, we'll, we'll end the poll question now and we'll go over these answers. Uh, first off, True or false, one tablespoon of healthy soil has more organisms on it, in it than there are people on the earth. And the answer to that is true. We're talking microorganisms, bacteria. There's a lot of healthy things in our healthy soil. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Illinois does have an official state soil. What is it? Well, the answer to that is drummer. Drummer silty clay loam. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, during our session. And finally, what was happening when Franklin Roosevelt said a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself? The answer to that is it was the Dust Bowl. It is the Dust Bowl. Going along with that, our, our speaker next week will be an author who wrote about the complications of the Dust Bowl. So we'll be talking with uh, Darcy Pattinson about a book, Erosion. So that is, the, uh, that is the end of our poll. Thanks for playing along. But folks, what we have now is we're really excited. We've got Marion Shire, and Marion is with United Soils out of Fairbury, and Fairbury is in uh, in central Illinois, uh, near the Pontiac area. Marion, you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about United Soil and your background before we show the video. Sure. Like you said, my name is Marion Shire. Um, I'm kind of a, an old codger. I 
worked for University of Illinois Extension for 33 years before moving to uh, United Soils in Fairbury. I'm the staff agronomist. And uh, during my extension career, I worked with lots of 4-H kids and farmers and helped people with their, their crops, and their livestock, and all that kind of stuff, the horticultural questions, all that. And now I'm specializing primarily dealing with soil fertility and how it has an impact on the growth and development of soils and trying to assist people in making sure that they are uh, treating their soil appropriately and not over fertilizing or under fertilizing, but trying to make sure that there's enough nutrients in the soil so that the crops grow very well. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about. So uh, uh, here in, in central Illinois, Bloomington area, we've had some pretty nice days. The snow has melted. And in some places, uh, we know that some farmers are dealing with a, a muddy mess out there, but that's part of it. We do need the, we need, the, do need the moisture for the plants. and uh, But more importantly, what's up with that soil? So we're going to talk about that, but we'll get started first with a video we've put together to kind of give you an overview of what happens with soil and soil sciences. So we're going to watch this. If you direct your attention to the screen, that would be great. And we'll show this. All right, so I'm going to share that. And My name is Marion Shire. I've been an agronomist here at United Soils for over nine years. When my children were young, their friends would ask what their father did. And my daughter would say, well, he you know, does this with crops and he does that with crops. But basically she'd give up and just say, he's got his master's degree in dirt. When you walk around in the grass or garden or in a field where crops are growing, the soil is the stuff under your feet that provides support for seeds to germinate and to grow. It anchors plant roots and provides moisture and essential nutrients for plants to grow and thrive. The earth soil is the most important natural resource. Without healthy soil, we would not be able to grow the plants we need for food, fiber, and shelter. Way back in 1938, Charles Kellogg said, essentially, all life depends upon soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. And today that's still true. Approximately half of the soil is air and water, while the other half is mineral and organic matter. The other half of the soil is much more complicated. The soil has organic matter that is, is living or has been living at some point. This includes decaying plant material, earthworms, insects, sow bugs, millipedes, bacteria, and fungi. Even animal manure, a lot of people call it animal poop, but it's still in the soil. The bacteria, fungi, and other microscopic organisms that live in the soil are responsible for breaking down and turning once living plant material and animal material into nutrients that can be used again and again by new plants and organisms. Plants, animals, and bacteria and fungi all play an important role in a healthy soil that is full of life. The fungi help the plants gain water and greater access to water and nutrients. The plant provides the fungi with energy produced through photosynthesis. A teaspoon of soil contains more microorganisms than there are people on the earth. That's about 7.6 billion microorganisms. That's just to show you how many critters there are in the soil. To encourage and possibly improve soil health, many producers have started using cover crops to increase and encourage microorganism growth, reduce soil erosion, and possibly help with weed control. And there are many miner minerals that join the organic matter in the second half of the soil. These mineral particles vary in size from very small, which we call clay, to slightly larger, we call silt, and then the larger particles we call sand. There are nutrients that plants need in large amounts, which are called macronutrients, which include nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There are secondary nutrients that are needed in somewhat smaller quantities, including calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and may be present in the soil in amounts sufficient for plant growth. Farmers and growers want to grow the best crops for food and fiber, and if the soil does not contain large enough amounts of these essential nutrients, the farmer or gardener will need to add one or more nutrients to the soil. The way to determine how much of each nutrient is already in the soil and the amount of nutrients to add to the soil is by taking soil tests. 
This is done by collecting a small sample of soil and having it tested in the laboratory. Because soils vary significantly in nutrient content from one place to another, many farmers often have soil samples taken using high-tech equipment, which allows samples to be taken from specific locations within the field. They can come back in a few years and retest the exact location, compare the soil test results to measure and ensure you're getting, uh, they've been successful in addressing the nutrient needs. Here at United Soils, we have sampling bikes equipped with GPS antennas to pick up the radio waves from the satellites that send the signals. After the soil samples are collected, they're delivered to the laboratory for analysis. That information is then loaded into a GPS-equipped fertilizer spreader, which applies varied amounts of fertilizer nutrients to each area of each field. That way, areas with low nutrient levels receive more fertilizer, while the higher nutrient level areas of the field receive lower amounts or perhaps none at all. This is important so that soil gets the right amount of nutrients in the right place. That ensures that we are using fertilizers in an environmentally friendly manner. There is so much to think about and do providing healthy food from the plants. Everyone who likes to eat should be interested in soils and how they're an integral part of the providing food and fiber for everyone. Possible careers related to soils include an agronomist, soil conservationist, crop production specialist, research scientists, research technicians, crop consultants, farmers, landscape business, crops educators, watershed technicians, microbiologists, and many, many others. Well, thank you for that, Mary. We really appreciate that. Uh, our AV crew came out and helped uh, 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 video uh, Marion. He, he gave us a lot of information. And one, one aspect of the careers, I wrote this down as something to talk about, was how technical um, this, this has become and how much you depend as, as a soil scientist on technology. Marion, you want to talk a little bit about that and your use of technology uh, computers and others, including all the, that high-tech equipment, how you use that uh, in, in helping uh, determine soil health? Well, you mentioned computer technology and uh, you know how involved it is. Well, it is very involved because once we analyze the soil uh, and determine how many nutrients there are in it and what quantities there are, we take that information and then plug that into a computer using specialized software what they will tell us what the concentrations of the nutrients are in the various areas of the field. And that software can then generate a file with, that can be plugged into a GPS equipped uh, variable rate technology spreader and apply varying rates of, of uh, fertilizers across the field based off of the exact sample location. And so the areas that have high soil test levels will get very little fertilizer, if any, and the lower sampling areas will get increasing amounts depending on how much is there and as those concentrations go down. So uh, technology is very much involved. You saw one of the robot computer uh, and analyzers we have in the lab. That is very much, uh, very high tech. It's uh, controlled by computers. Um, if, if you're interested in computers and technological things, you know, soil sampling, soil testing, uh, designing equipment to spread fertilizers, to analyze the, the, the samples, all of this kind of stuff is very high tech and gives lots of opportunities for people to find careers and jobs, you know, in the agricultural industry. And, you know, uh, one of the things about uh, living here in Illinois is uh, we're known for our good crop lands and for our good uh, production. Well, a lot of that has to do with our soil, but not only not only the soil, but taking care of the soil. You talked a little bit in the video about how farmers are are becoming real stewards of the land and how they're they're acting responsibly toward the environment. Now, Marion, you said you've been you've done this for a couple of years. You've been working with dirt. Can you talk about some of the changes you've seen in your career on how we are now uh, taking care of the soil differently? than we used to, maybe earlier in your career. Sure. Uh, when we think about soil sampling uh, 40, 50 years ago, if you took one sample per field, you were progressive. You were actually you know, measuring what was out in the field. 
And then they, they calculated what was to be applied and, or as far as fertility from that one sample. Well, that one sample could represent, you know, five acres or 20 acres or 500 acres. We didn't know. And with the extreme amount of variability in nutrient content across a field, that one sample was really not giving them a good snapshot of what was going on. Nowadays, as we've progressed with technological advancements, the use of GPS, satellite information, and all that kind of stuff, we can take samples with the GPS bikes I was showing uh, in the video, and we can come back in two years, four years, 10 years, whatever, down the road. And because of the advancements in technological uh, abilities, we can come back in the field and sample again within a, you know, less than a foot. If we have an RTK sample uh, equipped bike, we can have sub-inch accuracy. So we can come back to the exact same spot, take the soil samples again, rerun them, and get an impression as far as, you know, are we improving, are we staying stationary, or are we losing ground with the nutrient? You talked about what kind of things have, have changed through the years. I mentioned manure in the video. In the olden days, people livestock, they would spread the manure, but they were trying to get it out of the barn. They were, you know, filling the spreader up, going through the gate out into the into the crop field, turning on the spreader and spreading it till the spreader was empty and going back and reloading. And frequently they respread on the same spot in the field they did previously because they were just trying to get rid of the material. They weren't utilizing it for its nutrient content. Nowadays, because we have the ability to sample and get soil test results in very finite areas and very small uh, vicinities, we can go out and spread on the field where it needs to be spread as opposed to just disposing of it. We're utilizing the nutrients that are in the manure to the benefit of the crops and not just getting it out of the barns. Well, and Illinois does have a, a large uh, animal uh, uh, livestock population, but not all of our fertilizer comes from livestock. Uh, and sometimes fertilizer gets uh, people think it's some bad. Uh, you know, it's got a it's got a bad reputation. Why don't you talk a little bit about fertilizer and the importance of fertilizer? Is there anything that you could relate it to that the students might have a a more direct connection with, Marion? Well, obviously, you mentioned earlier about the stewards of the land situation. Farmers are the primary stewards of the land from the standpoint that they want to treat the soil appropriately so that the soil will respond and the crops can grow very well. If they misuse the soil, if they misuse the land, the crop yields are not going to be as, as high as they could have been otherwise. So we're looking at this from a standpoint that uh, we're trying to do things in environmentally sound methods. We're trying to only apply nutrients where they're needed and applying correct amounts. We're trying to make sure that the uh, crops have enough nutrients to grow you know, appropriately, but at the same time, not hindering things from an environmental standpoint. Farmers frequently get blamed or gets fingers pointed at them because of the loss of nutrients off of the land through tile drainage and whatnot, and that can happen, but over the last 30, 40 years, farmers have been adopting more and more conservation tillage practices, which reduces erosion, so we're not losing as many nutrients due to erosion across the surface of the soil and the ditches and the streams and the rivers, but we still may be losing some nutrients from the tile drainage because of the nitrates that are water soluble. And as the water moves through the soil profile, the nitrates can move down and be caught in the tiles and we can lose it that way. So we're trying to fine tune our, our management practices. We're trying to minimize our exposure to nitrate losses. And lots of people are now starting to use cover crops to try to uh, scavenge those nutrients before they, they leave the field. Well, and I think uh, you bring up a really good point. You, there's a lot of stuff that I just wrote down there that we could talk a little bit more about. But uh, for our students, just one thing to remember is, is uh, things are changing constantly. As you grow older, you do things a little differently. As you, as you come up with new experiences, uh, your parents don't have to tell you to, to not touch something hot or how to do things. You, you've learned some of those things. Farmers are doing the same thing. But let's talk a little bit about this relatively, we call it a relatively new practice of cover crops, although it's been around for a while. 
Mary, why don't you talk a little bit about cover crops and how you've seen that advance in your career? Well, cover crops really started taking hold, I'll say, within the last 15 or 20 years. And cover crops, their intent is to help protect the soil surface as well as get and maintain growing active root growth within the soil profile. Most of the time, cover crops are grown during the off-season of production practices. And what I mean by that is corn and soybeans and wheat tend to grow you know, during the warm months of the year. And after corn and soybean harvest is when the cover crops really start uh, to be you know, coming into their own because those are frequently planted at or about the time of harvest to maintain cover over the soil during the winter months. So the, the concept is to maintain surface residue, surface protection, uh, so that the falling raindrops don't cause erosion and move the soil particles off the field surface, as well as this, the cover crop roots uh, encouraging the microorganism growth in the soil and uh, helping to scavenge, like I mentioned earlier, the nitrates that might somehow you know work down through the soil profile into the, into the tile drain. So those cover crops can can take up the nitrates, utilize it in their growth, and not allow it to be lost off the field. I got a couple questions coming in. We'll we'll jump to another subject here real quick. But one of the questions is, why does Illinois have such good soil? Well, we were blessed with uh, the, the soil development, and as the uh, glaciers retreated back into the northern lands, uh, the soils that we had were uh, were left in place. And in central Illinois, primarily, we were raised or we're in a uh, an area that had lots of of cover crop or cover by uh, grasslands, big blue stem, little blue stem, all of the native grasses. And these grass plants grew and developed and developed root systems down deep into the soil profile. And as those plants died and those root systems decomposed, it allowed the development of organic matter in the soil and gave us our rich texture. As you move into some other areas of the state, southern part of the state has less productivity than we do because uh, a lot of that ground was in timber, timber soils. They did not have the dense root uh, masses of the grasses to, uh, to aid in their development. So there's a big difference between timber soil development and grassland development, how the, the soil has been managed, you know, did they uh, burn off the cover? Did they till it in? There's lots of lots of things that have happened over the last hundred years that has impacted the productivity of our soils. And for some of our students that are there, I know we've got some folks from that central Illinois area, our folks from Tuscola, they don't have to go very far to see where the glaciers started receding. Right there at that Mattoon to Cumberland uh, range is where you start to see the hills start to form. And that's as far as the glacier got. Uh, and uh, uh, before, before retreating back again, leaving some of that really, really good soil. Another question coming in about those different soil types. Why do soils have different names, Marion? Well, soils were named from the, the analysis when they've gone through and measured the depth of the surface, or what's called the A profile, the A horizon, that's the surface soil. B horizon is a little deeper, C is on deeper than that. And they look at the amount of sand, silt, and clay in those soils. They look at the amount of organic matter that's in the soils. They look at the minute colorations of the soil particles. And if you have a soil that has a very deep topsoil and a shallow B horizon, it's got a different name than something that's, that's a little bit different. So anytime that there was a significant variability or difference in the soil profile, they frequently got different names so that they were able to you know, designate that this was an XYZ versus a PQR or whatever. And uh, that's why the different names. A different name to, to showcase different people. Yeah, exactly. Different, just like different names for people. Exactly. That's a great question. Um, and, a, and a great answer, appreciate that. Uh, one of the other things that you talked about was uh, applying fertilizer at the right time. And in our soil ag mag, those of you who don't have that, you wanna talk about that. Marion, you didn't come out and say it, but you talked about applying fertilizer at the right time in the right place and the right, uh, the right rate and with the right source. 
Uh, some folks call that the four R method. Do you want to talk about how things have changed applying fertilizer to help make soil healthy? Well, the four R's are looking at the the right rate, right time, right place, right source, and we're looking at trying to tailor the utilization of nutrients based off of what is appropriate. Now, right time, historically, I'll say in the last 30 years or so, there was lots and lots of fall applied nitrogen fertilizer. Well, as we dealt with problems with nitrate concentrations in water, we have looked at that, you know, maybe putting that, that nitrogen out in the, in the field three, four, five, six months before the crops are gonna need it, that may not be the best option to choose. So we've, we're looking at people that are now applying their nitrogen, some of it in the fall, some of it in the spring, some pre-plant, some of it side dress, so that there's adequate amount of nitrogen out there, but we're not exposing it all to potential loss out in the field for you know, a long duration of time. Um, the right place, we, we, we discourage people from applying nitrogen fertilizers on the surface of the soil in the winter when there's snow on the ground, because it is water soluble. As the snow melts, it can you know get in the water, and then when the snow water moves off, it can dissipate and, and move off of the field. So the right place, sometimes we're looking at injecting it into the soil. Uh, a lot of our manures are injected into the soil as opposed to being surface applied because we protect it from potential loss. I could go on for you know three hours about this, but I'll, I'll stop <laughs> at this point and let you ask another question. I think that's a that's a, exa a great example of what your children said. You had your master's degree in dirt, so uh, uh, we appreciate the passion that you bring to that. Um, uh, one of the activities that we're going to be talking about today, we have coming on, is our uh, uh, soil your underwear contest. Uh, soil your underwear, uh, where where we're encouraging people to go out and bury a bury a clean pair of white underwear and. Uh, Watch what happens throughout the uh, throughout the duration of uh, the growing season. Uh, talking about those micronutrients and the bacteria and the earthworms, those type of things that, that go on with it. Um, and uh, it, in, in the end, because it's white cotton underwear, that should be uh, the, the it should dissolve. You know, it should should go away because it's a it's a it, you know the cotton is a edible to some of those insects and those type of things. So something to stop and think about, check out that. But I got a question here from Parker from, I believe, Hamilton. He wants to know, how do you know if you have good soil for gardening at home? Great question, Parker. Well, obviously, if you've got a, a garden, someone has probably, uh, you know, done some exploration of it in the past. But if you want to check and see what kind of nutrient levels you have, if you go out and take a vertical slice seven inches deep through the, from the surface soil down seven inches and collect about a cup, cup and a half of that. But we wanna make sure we get the, so, the total profile, not just the surface, not just seven inches down, but from the top down seven inches, you can send it into a soil testing lab. They can analyze it and tell you what kind of nutrient levels there are. Beyond that, obviously you need to make sure that you're, doing, you're trying to raise your garden in an area that has full sun, has adequate amount of water, but when it rains a lot, it doesn't pond and sit for three or four days. So there's lots of things to consider when we're trying to choose or, or look at garden samples or garden situations. That's a great question. Thank you for that answer. And, you know, the importance of, of uh, working with that, uh, Parker, we encourage you to look at the Soil Ag Mag or reach out to your extension. Uh, there are people there that can help you with that and, and talk about that. There's a lot of great books out there, too specifically talking about the, the attitude of maybe composting or uh, allowing some, you know, mulching up your leaves instead of burning them and allowing that, uh, that organic matter that Marion talked about earlier to be a part of the soil. Uh, I intrigue people about the underwear, Marion. People want to know why underwear. Uh, here's the short answer for that. Underwear at the top has that elastic band and the rest of it's just the cotton aspect. You could do socks. Those are cotton socks, but your cotton socks have a lot of elastic in it. So you would have stuff that, that, that wouldn't break down. So underwear, what you'd be left with is the, uh, you'd be left with the elastic band versus everything else would be eaten away. You could use a t-shirt too, but uh, it's more fun to say soil your underwear than soil your t-shirt. So hope that helps uh, Mrs. Stansfield's class in Tuscola, uh, Stanfield class in Tuscola. I believe it's Mrs. Stansfield. 
Um, so with that, Marion, uh, we are we are coming close to the end. Is there anything else you wanted to share? You covered a ton in your video. Anything else you wanted to, to drive a point home with? Well, kind of a final parting comment is that the fungi are the workhorses of the soil from the standpoint of decomposition. Uh, the other creatures, you know, also are in the process, but the fungal activity seems to be what breaks down the vast majority of the organic matter. You mentioned the soil, your underwear, you know, it depends on the, how, what kind of polyester content there is, if there's going to be anything else left in those, those uh, cotton underwear. But um, it, it's one of those things, the higher the concentration of cotton, the more likely it is that there will be less and less material still left. So if anybody has any questions they want to ask me otherwise, you know, feel free to get in touch with Kevin or, or you know, send me an email or give me a call. I'd be, be glad to try to respond. And worm farmer. I mentioned compost a little bit. There's a great book you can check out if you want to know more about compost called Compost Stew. And finally, our book that's coming up, and we're going to be interviewing the author next week at this same time, uh, Erosion by Darcy Pattinson. Folks, with that, we appreciate your time, taking the time to learn a little bit more about soil. Check out our lessons and our activities on our blog site and on social media. And I hope that our, our teachers from Tuscola and our students from Tuscola might bury some underwear and see how healthy their soil is down there. With that, thank you very much. And we'll talk to you next week.